without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Ruth. How many of you followed her or have read some of her material on the track? Interesting stuff. Um, so if you haven't had the chance yet, um, it's worth checking out uh, her blogs and, and her notes. So it's good information there. Um, I'm just going to keep this very brief and, and introduce Ruth, or Ruthless, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, get out of the way of her gear and her presentation. And also, I want to thank Jim for helping set this all up. Thank you as well for her husband. So thanks, Jim. Bill. As well. Bill. 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 I saw it. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> get that out of here. Good evening. I thank you so much for coming. But before we go any further in this talk, I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of you have ever just thought or dreamt of a big adventure? Maybe hike, bike, okay. Wow, that is good. It's not surprising you're here, that's great. Um, now, how many of you have done one or more? <laughs> yes, he can't even count them. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so happy to see who I'm speaking with. Today I'm going to take you behind the scenes to peek behind the curtain how I've been able to have many big adventures in my life already and how these were able to be moved from dreams, as many of you have, into reality. Because I'm certainly no different than any of you, but I want to share how my process. I'll share my own experiences, both the good and the less good, so that you might learn from some of them and profit from them or avoid them. Uh, my, attention, my attention is primarily on the more mature adventurers, but this can certainly apply to everyone. Uh, first, I want to share my background with you so you can understand where I come from. As a child, my family's hobby was TV. I was born in 1952, we had one channel, we lived in a little town in Colorado in the mountains, and my exercise for the day when I wasn't riding bikes with friends was when my dad would say, Ruthie, get up and change the channel, because these didn't exist. So that's, we watched TV, but we were in the mountains, it was beautiful, and my friends and I played outside, and that's where I developed a love for it, but our family never was active. We did some car camping, as you'd call it, but hiking or any of that, no. Um, in my 20s, though, because of the influence of my husband, the man in the black hat, Bill, <laughs> I started moving around more. Um, he's always been active in soccer and other pursuits, and I thought, wow, wow, you can do things. And it was the 1970s with the craze of jogging, and so I started jogging, but I just did like a mile at a time, um, maybe three times a week, and I thought I was really hot stuff. But this continued in my 20s, and then in my 30s, I started inching a little longer. In my 40s, <laughs> My motto now is basically, if something's worth doing, let's overdo it. So I'm, I moved into marathons, the 26.2 marathons, and longer. I got up to a couple that were 100 kilometers, 63 miles. Um, and I ran until my mid-60s, from my 20s. Um, in my 50s, I introduced cycling as well. So advance and show me at uh, the Boston. And so I evolved into cycling, and the distances got longer on that as well. And I see a big smile. Have you done this? No. <laughs> the gentleman in the brown, I thought he might be familiar with this. Um, with, with a group, before I did this one, um, I cycled from Cincinnati to Cleveland several times with a small group. I, with a group, I cycled from Oregon down to the Mexican border, and that was also with a small small group, and then this is called the Southern Tier, not T-E-A-R, we never cried. <laughs> I did it just with one friend. Uh, there was no camping. I proposed the idea to her to camp across the U.S. She said no, the friendship remained because of that, I think. It would have been a real challenge. So that's with my friend Mary Jo. We started at San Diego on the beach and finished at St. Augustine, Florida. My husband and her husband were with us in the car the first 
couple hundred miles because we would, if something happened to our bikes other than a flat, we couldn't do anything. And we would have been hundreds of miles from a shop. So they were there with the car. Um, also in my 50s, I began long distance hiking. And we were living in the French Alps at that time. What a privilege. And there's a trail called the GR5. GR stands for, in French, Grande Randonnée. And there's many GRs around Europe and France. And Grande Randonnée means like big walk, big hike. It's 1,500 miles. It stretches from the North Sea in the Netherlands and goes through the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, a bit of Switzerland and the full length of France all through the Alps. And it's stunning. And I did this. We lived near the southern third uh, in the Alps. And people said, oh, you run marathons. You ought to do the GR5. Well, hiking in these Alps has nothing to do with running on pavement. But it gave, I had the endurance and the determination. So I started down in the south and did the Alps first. And then worked my way up, did the middle a couple years later, and did the north. Uh, to finish up a couple years later. Again, no camping yet. Well, you can guess what country that is. That's where it started. Look at that, the Alps. It was just, it awakened me to the beauty and then finished at the Mediterranean near Nice. But I never considered camping um, because it's so populated there. You can stay in hostels and hotels cheap hotels, it's just lovely. And that's part of the fun, so. And that was a learning trip. Moved back to the US in my 60s. I am now 71, so you know. Um, and I resisted as long as I could <laughs> the Appalachian Trail because it was called the Green Tunnel because you're under trees so much and there were no Alps there and the views wouldn't be as dramatic. Uh, it's 2,200 miles long, 14 states it goes through from Georgia to Maine. I finally gave in because it's like, what, the mother of all trails or whatever you want to call it. It is just so well known and I couldn't live in the U.S. and not do it. So I started solo. I did what's called a flip-flop. I started in the center at Harper's Ferry and I went to the south. Um, and then I went back to Harper's Ferry and went to the north. But I did this over four summers. Um, I have no interest in doing 2,200 miles nonstop. I just am afraid of what would happen to my body. So I did it over four summers. Now I was backpacking with camping gear, and it was a real learning experience. There we go. That's down in the south, Klingman's Dome, and that's in the north. Now I'm working on this one, Buckeye Trail. Uh, it's 1,400 miles. Uh, I started in 2020, and I'm still, I'm only in the second half now. This one I'm doing when the weather's nice and it pleases me. It, I love that. I make sure that the weather's going to be nice. We live down in Cincinnati, so it's kind of a drive to get up towards Akron and Cleveland. So I want to make it worth my while for up to seven days. Uh, but I'd rather not get rained on there. I got enough of that on the Appalachian Trail. I self-support with my truck and my bike. So I will say I arrive there Sunday and I'm going to hike several days. Sunday afternoon, I'll drive to where I'm going to finish Monday afternoon, lock my bike up somewhere. In town, I'll lock it at a parking lot or the police station. I'll get permission. Or if it's out in the woods, I'll hide it in the woods. I have a great chain for it. It's an e-bike, and it's very heavy. You can see the ramp. I need help getting it up and down with that ramp. And then I'll drive back to the beginning, camp somewhere near there, and then walk to my bike and ride back to the truck. And that way I can be self-supportive. And then every third or fourth day, I need to plug in the bike to recharge it. So darn it, I have to stay in a hotel with a bed. <laughs> so I do, I make the sacrifice. It's really fun. And it's like my five or six year project. I don't care, it's, I will finish. I've now made it up the east, I'm sorry, the west, the north, and down to Akron. So working my way around. This past summer, now in my 70s, I did the Colorado Trail, as has Andy. And this is 500 miles in the Rockies, and it, most people do a southbound. Uh, you start near Denver and head through the mountains, as you can see, and end up in Durango down by the Four Corners. I hike alone, but 
my friend there in the black hat joins me usually the first four days, my husband, <laughs> the first four days of, or five of most hikes. And that, so he can really see what I'm doing. It's very exciting to share it. And then um, in January of 2023, uh, pardon, pardon the gaps thing. This was a, a paper I got from Florida Trail Association, and they're trying to eliminate the road walks, which they call the gaps, so that it's less road walk, more trail. I'm doing this solo. I'm doing this over in three long sections. Uh, I'm also in my second half here. Uh, I started in the south, as many people do, and headed north, and I've um, somewhere, I don't have the pointer on me, they told me I'm somewhere up in this area now. I made it to here, and now this year I made it to here. So I'll finish f the last 500 miles next January. But that is an exciting trail. You'll see some cool pictures. All of these involve different modes of trap movement, obviously, biking, running, hiking, solo or with others, wide variety of terrain, environment, climates, elevations, what do they all have in common for me? It's the process that I go through before, during, and after each adventure. Uh, the three general practices that facilitate success for me are planning, preparation, and perseverance. That is the Florida Trail. Again, I tell you, it's washed out here, but we'll enjoy them all anyway. There we are. A goal without a plan is just a wish. You've got to have a plan to bring it into action. What is it, first of all, that you want to do? What's up here in your mind? How deeply do you want it? It's so great to have a dream, but let's make it a concrete goal so it actually happens. And this has to move into being a plan that you will act on. How does it match up with your abilities? I'm personally doing the trails right now that I consider the hardest because I know as I get older, it will, hard will be easier for the rest of the world. You know, I'm, I'm, I will continue doing what looks hard to me until I need to downgrade it a bit. Um, but I do plan on having hiking boots on my 90th birthday and going out for a hike, so join me. <laughs> um, this darling town was part of the GR5. I look ahead, I look at the terrain, I look at the resources, lodging choices, trail towns for resupplying food. Looking at that, it's darling, but there's no place to stay and the shopping would be very minimal for resupplying. A bigger town like this offers hotels. This again is in France, it's just so precious. So you look at all those to determine your distances. When will I need to get more food? Where will, when will I take a break and how, need some lodging? Then you think about when would you like to do it? What is best for your schedule? For me, Florida Trail January. It still can get very cold there in the 20s and 30s in the winter. But so you take the appropriate gear with you. But Colorado, I wouldn't be hiking in in January. I chose late July and August because there were fewer monsoons, fewer storms then, and uh, hopefully no snow, and there was none. That is, yes, there's my truck in the background. This was on Buckeye Trail. It's hard on the Buckeye Trail because I have to be able to ride a bike and not freeze my hands off while I'm riding back to the truck. So this was just barely making it. But you look at the rainfall and the temperatures and the crowded trails, and uh, I think avoiding the crowded trails gives you a better camping experience also. How would you do it? In what, in what manner? You don't need to know all the answers in the beginning. It'll evolve as you continue the process. Where would you start and finish? As I said, for me, I started at Harper's Ferry, which is, that's their headquarters, and it's called a flip-flop when you start somewhere and go to one end and come back to it and go to the other end. And that was how I did the Appalachian Trail in four summers. There's also being a through hiker, point A to point B, finishing it all in one go within one calendar year. I've just done that for the Colorado Trail because it was 500 miles and I could tackle that. Um, there's section hiking. 
and that's where it could be either two days, some two days, which I'm doing the, floor, uh, the Buckeye Trail, or it could be longer. Um, hope you aren't offended when I say what a lasher is. A long ass section hiker <laughs> is an acronym, and that's what I am, uh, because I like weeks or months, so usually not past. I've, I've done more than two months, but for me that's just long mentally. So day hiking, section hiking, or through hiking. Do you do it solo or with others? This was my daughter and her two girls who came and finished the last mile in the southern half with me. It was so wonderful. That's Springer Mountain down in, in Georgia. And then we walked back to the car together and I turned to Becky after I'd been on the trail now f that time for about two months and I said, take care of me, Becky. And she did. <laughs> um, and you often need support of other people. This is food that I was going to use during what's called the 100 uh, mile wilderness, uh, the northernmost part of the Appalachian Trail, and I needed 10 days worth of food. And my husband mails me my food, which I've prepared at home, and we'll talk more about that. So that's definitely support that I need. That, that's my food that was mailed to a hostel where I stayed. Will you need special equipment? biking the southern tier definitely we needed we had good bikes we needed panniers that we put our gear in uh, but we didn't get the camping gear now the biggest question is why do you want to do this adventure what is it that appeals to you regarding the a appalachian trail would it surprise you to learn that one out of five people who attempt to through hike the whole thing in one go falls short of their goal, one out of five. Uh, what is it that drives 80% of these attemptees home? I learned a lot of knowledge, I gained a lot of knowledge use, reading this book, Appalachian Trials, a cute play on words. The Psychological and Emotional Guide to Successfully Through Hiking the Appalachian Trail. It can apply to any big endeavor that you wanna do. You might think that the hardest part is like the Appalachian Trail, which is five million steps long, would be purely physical. Yeah, it is a physical feat, pushing your body to new extremes, but the psychological and emotional struggle is truly what drives people off. It's the homesickness, the heat, the cold, the storms, the boredom, the pain. So it's not just those mountains. Those, these are some of the primary reasons they quit, not because the climb's too hard. The author says there's three categories of AT hikers. Those who succumb to the mental challenges and quit. Those who rely on sheer determination, grit their teeth and press on to the end despite being unhappy with the process. And then those who enjoy it most, if not all, we've got to be honest, of their experience while successfully completing the hike. And maybe the hike for you is four days, that's fine, uh, but to complete it. Three statements come from this book that the author wants you to consider and write your answers down for, write down. I'm doing this because. So for the Appalachian Trail, I wrote down I'm craving adventure, I like challenges. I need time. Some people need to reevaluate evaluate their life. I feel pretty good about mine. I wanted to be a good example for grandkids and I wanted to be completely immersed in nature. Number two, when I successfully complete this, okay, what would you say? For me, I would have greater self-confidence and it's the truth. I'm no longer fearful at the, do at the dentist. I mean, I can do that. I've climbed up boulders. Um, I will have a story of a lifetime. If I give up on this dream, question number three, how will you feel? I'll be very disappointed in myself as soon as I get home. And I have to say, I came home early from Florida Trail this year because of extreme flooding. I could have continued on roads, but I would have been missing the Suwannee River, some of the prettiest part. I came home. <coughs> and I self-doubted myself a lot for it. Once you get home, you say, why did I do that? I could have gone back and walked by the Swanee later, but it all works out, it all works out. Um, 
If I give up on this dream, I might not be the person I believe I could be. So something else I have learned from other speakers of great importance, positive self-talk. So important throughout our whole life. By the time I heard recently a researcher say, by the time we are 18, we've heard over 150,000 negative statements directed at us by adults or other kids. You're so stupid, or why can't you read, or you're always the last. And it's time that we change the way we talk to ourselves. Speak to yourself, encourage yourself the way you would for a friend. You are your own best friend. That's who you're going through your whole life with. And so these statements will help you believe it. And the more you say it, the more it re rewires your brain and it will make it successful. Maybe you won't get to the very end, but you'll feel better and you'll go back, which I've done. I've gone back many, many times after injuries. So I just really encourage you. There's a connection between the body and the mind. And actually, the mind is the body. They're one. And our thoughts can truly affect our health and our performance. And our words can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you are doing your adventure, don't dwell on your age or any lack of skills. You are what you are. I'm proud of my age. I am what I am. And I'm, when I, I would, whenever you trip and fall, you say, all right, this makes me stronger. I learned not to do this, not to. <laughs> my, my doctor is here who stitched up in <clears throat> my chin when I wasn't paying attention in our suburban neighborhood a week and a half ago and had to get stitches in my chin. Uh, did a good job. No, it looks beautiful. <laughs> but I wasn't paying attention. I thought, okay, I'm going to pay attention on curbs. So go on the assumption that you can do this. You don't hope to do this. You can and will do this. And this will make it all possible. If you say, I will try to do this, that means there's a chance of failure. Like if I said to Andy, try and sit down. He might think, what's wrong with the chair? But if I said, please sit down, he'd sit down. So certainty, not trying. All right, you've decided, now what? Our planning turns to preparations. So we've had planning, now we'll have preparations. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Ben Franklin. I do research. I do a ton of research before every hike, maybe more than many people. Since my food is sent to me, I need to know where it's going to be sent. I use guidebooks. I use maps. I talk to experienced hikers. I read blogs. I go online, look at the trails website. I have started joining Facebook groups for individual um, individual trails. I didn't use to belong. I didn't belong to one for Appalachian Trail. Didn't know it existed. It's been very helpful. Um, I. I read what's on the, there's an app on your phone that you can get called Far Out that has maps and it will show when you're on the trail where you are on that trail. And people can put comments there about a section of the trail or a hostel or a camping area and you can learn, okay, here's what I'll be getting into in this area. And podcasts with interviews, I've learned so much listening to people talk about. So there's the AT guide that I used a lot. I don't know if people use it as much now that we have the app far out, but it has line drawings in there of the elevation, and it will tell you uh, what, you know, the name of the mountain and the shelter and everything. It, I have examples up here afterwards. I'd love it if you came up and just looked at the books. This is what the app looks like for far out. And this shows me when I was on the trail, and it shows there's a water source, but it's seasonal, might be working, might not. That's a full drop, so there's a lot of water there usually. And underneath the white marking, you can see there's an open-sided shelter, so I know where I, can, where I can spend the night if I want to stay in a shelter. So that, this is a wonderful, wonderful sight. Uh, after that, you start writing your itinerary. This is my rough itinerary. They all tend to look rough by the end, once I'm done. But 
I choose where I'm going to have my zero days, my rest days, meaning zero miles hiked. And this is where Bill will send me my food so I can resupply. It's usually every four to five days. And I take, I plan very modest mileage the first two or three weeks, maybe mostly just two. By then I'm antsy to get going and I'm getting stronger. I look at the terrain, the tr my training, the altitude, and I, uh, I account for that. This is a marathon, whatever I'm doing, not a sprint. I underestimate the distances I can do. I like to err on the side of caution. Uh, if you're hiking with other people, you have to take that into account though. But the way on the Florida Trail this year, uh, my first week I was with two girlfriends and we all hike at different rates. So we'd camp together, say, okay, see you at that campground this, at, this evening, or maybe we'd meet for lunch and we'd all just head out at our own speed. And that, for me, that's ideal. Uh, but if you have to plan, if you're traveling with a dog or with a friend and you want to stay together, you have to plan that together. Um, on the southern tier, the bike ride, we only took a rest day, I believe out of our six weeks on the trail, uh, we only took about three rest days because my friend is extremely, I was just with one, one friend there, she's very goal oriented and she just goes crazy sitting around and she can thrive on that even though she's seven years older than I am. But we weren't camping. I was younger, <clears throat> younger, so uh, it worked out okay. I, biking is taxing, but I think with a backpack on your back going up mountains is more for me. On the GR5 in France, I only took one a week. Uh, I was not dealing with camping gear. I was younger. Now I do one every four to six days. I'll hike four days and then take a day off. That's ideal for me. Um, I really like Nero days, which is nearly a zero. That means reduced mileage. So ideally, I will hike five miles. You know, normally I hike average 15 a day. I'll hike five miles and then I'm at my destination and I have all afternoon at my hostel or hotel and then I've got all the next day my zero. So it's just like a luxury of time to put my feet up and enjoy with no additional hotel charge because I get there early. What kind of lodging will we stay in? The AT has so many shelters. I don't know of any other trail personally that has this many. They have about 250 for the 2200 miles. They're meant to be about five to 10, 15 miles apart. And they're open front. That one is a relatively small one and you just throw your air mattress or whatever on the ground, on the floor and line up like hot dogs on a, on a broiler. And uh, it's, it's a great place to meet other hikers and have fun. There's almost always a privy. There is a water source, a stream or a spring and some method of storing food. This is a pole and it has the long V-shaped uh, pole that you put your bag on and then lift it up so that animals can't get to it. The whole goal is protect your food and also protect the animals from developing the taste for the food. This is a bear locker that I would call a locker that they have at some, not as much as I'd like. It's pretty safe, except some campers use it as a trash can, so that's why they don't have more of them. <clears throat> you can camp in the shelter or you can camp on the grounds. In the front here is a tarp that I made. I used this for the whole Appalachian Trail and I'll talk more about making that later. Um, I like being near the shelter but having my privacy and just eating my dinner with them at the table and then going off. You can camp with others in areas that are kind of mashed down and you can see that others have camped there. Commercial campgrounds, there's my tarp again, drying my clothes out. Those are fun. Every now and then, you know, you get homesick for other, I get homesick for families or something. Uh, just everyday life and it's fun to see the kids riding their bikes, but mostly I don't go to those. You can stealth camp, camping all by yourself somewhere, and you like to think nobody else has ever camped here. Well, as many millions of people that get on that trail. I'm guessing they did but it's, it's really fun to carve out your own little place. In towns, 
or in the country you can stay at hostels. Woods Hole, one of the most famous and lovely and serves a wonderful dinner. There's another one that's a church converted to a hostel where you can stay for a minimal price, sometimes like $35, something like that and kitchen facilities are usually available. You're sleeping most often on bunks, co-ed rooms. It's fun, it's so fun. You just sleep in your clothes, whatever. I have earplugs for this purpose, uh, but it's just, I got the biggest fit of giggles uh, on the GR5 in the Alps my first time in a co-ed room. I was with a male friend who was hiking with me and I just, it, I'd never slept in a room with four men, you know, <laughs> it was just, it's fun. It's so convivial. This is an Airbnb cabin that I stayed in. That was lovely. That was my own little cabin behind their main house. And then there are Appalachian Mountain Club lodges in Maine and New Hampshire. You reserve a bunk or a cabin at these places months in advance or by chance there's a cabin, we quickly trashed that. It was Bill and I and two male friends. We really trashed that place quickly. If you can stay free sometimes, if you haven't booked something, if you, it's work for stay, you know, you wash dishes and then get to put your camping gear on the floor of the dining room and sleep there maybe. Um, maybe you'll stay with someone who's a local, who befriends people. They're called trail angels and they, um, sometimes open up their homes for people. The most unusual one that I've stayed in was a garage. <laughs> it was pouring down rain. I'd made, already contacted him in advance, and I like to say any carport in a storm. It was, it was cold, but I could use the hot shower in the house, and it kept his lively dogs away from me. I appreciated it. it was, I like uniqueness. Uh, your itinerary will continue to change even when you're on your hike. Um, meanwhile, you need to be doing your training. You want to get a base fitness, doing your squats, working out on hills. If it's a hilly train for a Florida trail, I just get in the distance mostly because it's flat. Uh, similar for cyclists. Uh, the final month or so, you will add your backpack and gradually add weight to it. Then you will do a shakedown hike if you're lucky. That's a practice hike of hopefully two nights at least. One you can do, but two works best. Use all your gear. If you drove in your car to the park where you're gonna do your shakedown hike, just ignore the car then. And I've done a couple of these. I've done one at Germantown Metro Park, not far from here. Miami Whitewater Forest. Hawking Hills, I did some, Shawnee State Forest, and Red River Gorge, all good sites for it. My longest shakedown was a week long. I, it was at Harper's Ferry a few months before I was gonna start my first section. And they had a festival and they taught us lots about the trail and they checked our packs and tried to light, make them lighter for us. One other thing, I learned how to filter water during that week. I learned a lot of things. Now let's look at gear. Carry as little as possible, but choose that little with care. Your goal is to be comfortable and safe while hiking. The lighter the load, the easier the tra trail and fewer injuries. Every pound that you add to your body is like five pounds added to a load to your spine. So you really want to be careful. This is an example of what I took on the trail one year. Take what you need, not just want. And you continue to refine it according to the trail that you're on. This is an example now. We're moving on to the big four. The backpack is the first of the big four. You want to really get the weight down on these individual items and you start with the heaviest things first, such as backpacks. Use a postal scale to weigh things and keep a list so that you know grams turn into ounces and ounces turn into pounds and you'll pay dearly for it. Your backpack might have a frame on it or it will be frameless. Uh, these have hip belts. My present most used backpack has hip belts that will hold the phone and snacks and it does have a frame inside it. The lightest ones uh, can be ordered online from 
various companies whose names are on those papers there. Here's how my Here's my, how my backpacks evolved. On the southern tier, on the bikes, we had our panniers, just two small ones, no camping gear. On the GR5, I had a humongous backpack for a person who was always staying in a lodging and bought my food as I went. I just carried snacks with me. It was way too many luxuries with me. When I was finishing up the GR5, I found this book. And Ray Jardine talks about lightening the pack. He's one of the grandfathers of lightening the pack. And he gives very good examples of how to do it. And he also sells online very well put together kits on how to make your own gear. I started with his backpack. This is another one just like it. I have done three sizes of them. This is 10 ounces. That other one is lightweight, it's two pounds, but there's a big difference. But there's no frame, so you have to pack very light in there or it will hurt your shoulders, I have certainly learned. But that was the first one that I made. Um, and on the GR5, that was the one that I had sewn. And I used that on half of the Appalachian Trail. So that is another version of the original one that I showed you. I decided I wanted the waist pouches. I needed to put more weight on my hips, not all of it on my shoulders, because it's very hard for me to go ultralight. Now I use, by ULA, the circuit. All right, the sleeping system. He also sells kits for sleeping quilts. This is upside down. You can see the back. This would be facing my air mattress. Sleeping quilts are nice because uh, they're versatile. You can tuck it under you if it's cold or open it up if it's warm. Uh, this one happens to be a synthetic, not down. Uh, I sewed three of those, but I found they're bulkier, the synthetic, so I have moved on now to down quilts. I do use them when I'm in, in, uh, on the Buckeye Trail sometimes, and I don't stay quite as warm with these. A pad can be underneath you, can be inflatable, or foam, I've got examples you can see up here later. You look at the R value because so much cold comes up from the earth. I use an inflatable pillow uh, because I'm a side sleeper. Some people just put clothes in a bag. The next big item, number three, is the shelter system. And this is my husband's tent, the orange one there. That is a tent, it's very, they're very popular with their own poles part of it, it kind of bent poles. And also popular, growing much more popular, are hammocks, but then you need really sturdy trees the right distance apart. Some people sleep in bivvies, which are very low tents. This is ultra light. You just crawl in and you are like a cocoon in there. I decided to make his tarp. And that's all the fabric. He sends you the fabric, very detailed instructions. If you can read and have access to a sewing machine, you can do it. And that's the finished product. And tucked inside is the bug net tent. Now that's a bivy. I have to crawl in feet first and then close the zippers and crawl out. Uh, I really like it. I did the whole Appalachian Trail with this system. It keeps you nimble. I do a lot of yoga, hooray for that. But for Florida Trail and Colorado Trail, I knew I would be spending more time in my tent to hide from the bugs in Florida at dusk and dawn and to hide from the thunderstorms up in the Rockies. There we are, look at that view, Twin Lakes. Oh, it was wonderful. And inside it has a bug net tent, but I can sit upright in it and it has served me well. The hiking poles serve as its support two hiking poles. They're, this is a different one, a little offset from the way they usually are. Now, my favorite of the big four is the food system. You need to decide how you're going to get your food. Will you resupply along the way at grocery stores, Walmarts? What will you eat? Will you eat tortillas and wraps and jerky, uh, Snickers, Pop-Tarts, or will you get food drops from home? as I did. They're mailed to hostels or hotels or the post office general delivery. This is Shaw's, one of the most famous hostels up north on the Appalachian Trail. Look at all those food boxes from home for the 100 mile wilderness for the week to 10 days that people would be out. I'll talk more about the food that I eat a little later, but let's just look quickly at ways that you can store your food on the trail. 
follow that yellow line and down there you'll see a bear, a bag hanging, holding the food. I tried this a couple times. I couldn't throw over this. So it does not work for me. And a lot of bears know, oh, let's break this rope and it'll come down. So I needed other options. This is called an ursac. And there's an example up here. Inside is a hopefully airproof, scent proof Ziploc bag. And this one is rated uh, critter and bears. They cannot open it. They may mash it to bits, but your food will not temp it will not convert them to being eating human food. Uh, in the middle, you'll see my black canister with stickers on it. The bear canister is one of the most reliable ones, but you're carrying an extra pound, pound and a half. But I use that on the Florida Trail and on the Colorado Trail, just because of bears at both. And I don't like the weight, but I really appreciate the safety of it. Water purification, the most popular one I would say is the Sawyer filter. You collect water in a dirty water bag, you screw it on and line it up with your smart water bottle, which most, almost everybody uses just because of the size of it and how it matches up well. Other people also use tablets or drops sometimes, but you have to wait 15 to 30 minutes for those to work. Now. There is no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. So what goes on your feet? Right now, the most popular thing is to wear trail runners. And I have an example with good grip to them. But I did most of the Appalachian Trail, maybe almost all of it in um, the hiking boots, not all this pair, things wear out. But I just felt more secure at it. But they are very heavy, and that translates to more effort used. That's what I wear on the trail every day, every day, one outfit. I have my clothing treated by Insect Shield that you send it in and they treat it with permethrin, which you can do with a spray bottle at home. And that will treat it for the life of the garment. It will be safe from ticks and flying insects. I have one set of sleeping show clothes, uh, a warm base layer. I have uh, an insulated puffy, an insulated down jacket up here, a windbreaker, gloves, a buff for my neck. That's my rain gear. I use a rain kilt that I like because you don't have to take your shoes off, which you would do for rain pants. And that is a regular raincoat, but now I use frog togs, which is bright pink from Walmart, dirt cheap, and it works for me really well because some of the more expensive uh, don't breathe as well as that has for me. My husband chooses to use a poncho. And this is just an example of other gear that I bring, medical kit, personal care, and communications, a Garmin in reach, headlamp, charging cables, battery packs. Back to the food. Exercise is king, nutrition is queen. Put them together, you've got a kingdom. Frankly, this is my favorite part of the talk. What kind of diet do you want to eat on the trail? This is not a vacation from treating your body well. Really, you are demanding a lot of it. You need to put premium fuel in it. People get by with eating less than stellar food. The first year I did it, I thought, that I was eating healthy. It was a paleo diet, high on meat and vegetables, and that was kind of it. Um, very high on meat. Uh, no no f grains, no beans. Um, the only way I could do it was through dehydrating my own food at home, removing their liquid in a slow oven, basically, with air blowing over it. You can buy commercially prepared ones. They'll be very high in salt. You aren't always getting exactly what you want. It's very expensive. I chose to do it myself at home. I have two dehydrators now, the Excalibur on the right with nine square trays that is my favorite, and the Nesco Garden Master with four trays, and I've been buying some more too. Those have holes in the middle for the air to travel through the heated air, and so the one on the right is a little more space efficient. How to prepare food? Well, you could prepare individual 
ingredients and then mix them together. A common lunch for me is mixing things like this together and adding powdered hummus that I've made. And that's my lunch with a corn tortilla. There's bananas. You can do complete recipes. This is a chili. Oh boy, it's a sweet potato chili. I do curries. I do stews, tomato based. When I was vegan, and if you enjoy meat, you can make uh, your own jerky. That was ground beef jerky. So you cut your food into uniform pieces, cook it all uh, about five to 10 hours thoroughly. How to store it in Ziploc bags is what I choose. This is one day's food, breakfast, lunch, dinner across the top and snacks across the bottom. I do buy those sweet potatoes. I'm addicted to those, those are great. Or you can vacuum seal things for a longer term so that air will not destroy some of the nutrients. There I am with one month's worth of food lined up. Each day's food is in a Ziploc like this. And then I put it in the freezer to really make it last longer. So I always have an inventory going in my freezer. Where did I learn all this? Through the backpackingchef.com, which is on that handout sheet. He has great cookbooks, whether you eat vegetarian, vegan, or omnivore with meat. You can learn so much from him, just the technique and recipes. How do you eat these foods when you're on the trail? Well, the most traditional way is to rehydrate them with a stove and a little burner. This is the MSR um, pocket rocket stove that opens out like a fan and you put your pot on the top. To save weight, I brought foil instead of a lid. I don't know that that did much difference. And you put your food in and you put equal amount of water, maybe a little bit more, and you bring it to a boil for one minute and then you let it steep for about 15 minutes and then it's ready to eat. I do cold soaking. I did almost all the Appalachian Trail with the stove, but I got tired of having to clean that pot that was messy now and, oh, is there still some gas in that canister? With this, I just have a plastic container. I put my food in, I cover it. It's still, again, the same thing, but three hours at room temperature in, the, in my backpack. At breakfast, I'll start rehydrating lunch in my backpack. It's done at lunch. I eat it, I put dinner in, add water, and when I get to camp, my dinner's ready. So, and then overnight, my oats. I, I really like this. And to clean it, I put a little water in it, shake it, drink it, done. You would never pour it out because it's like, come on bears, here we go, smorgasbord. So no, that I really like the convenience of this. And yeah, it's not hot but by the time I get to it, it's lukewarm anyway. So before I explain a bit more about my specific way of eating, let me ask with a show of hands, how many of you know someone who has had a heart attack? Keep your hands up. A stroke, cancer, okay. These are all the diseases that need not exist. They are foodborne illnesses foodborne diseases. After leaving the AT from the Northern Finnish, I was recovering on the sofa with stress fractures in my hips. I was looking for magic foods for healing. And I found on Netflix something called The Game Changers, a documentary. It showed a real burly guy looking healthy. It was about whole food plant-based eating, which means vegan, but in a healthy way. There's many ways to do vegan. I decided by the time of the end of documentary, I was going to eat that way. We can all greatly increase our odds at avoiding all of those diseases. This statement is backed up by countless research. It just takes decades for things to come to the public and be approved of by the medical society. Let me explain what it is. I say yes to fruits, vegetables, whole grains, brown rice, not white, for example, legumes, which are peas, beans, and lentils. The whole food plant-based stands for eating food as close to its original form, not the highly processed foods we see in the middle of the supermarket on the shelves. I eat the real food, not manufactured food-like products. That is what my whole food plant-based 
dishes usually look like. I say no to all meat, <clears throat> meats, anything that had a mother or a face, all dairy products, which are basically liquid meat be and eggs. Because of my own personal genetic risk for heart attacks and high cholesterol, I've chosen to follow a doctor's plan that also goes what we call SOS free, salt, oil, and sugar free. Uh, I have his book here for prevent and reverse heart disease. It works miracles. It takes a while to learn it and get used to it, and, but your taste buds are heightened. I love my food. It's so delicious. I've gained so much more than I've given up. Within the first two weeks, aches and pains were greatly reduced. Bill joined me on it, too. I felt clearer headed. I went off my antidepressant I'd been on. My cholesterol lowered. My prediabetes, gone. Thyroid medications reduced. Much faster recovery from sports now. My taste buds are heightened, and food is delicious and much more varied. I love my food, and it loves me back. And I feel 20 years younger than what it says on my license, driver's license. I was able to use many of the recipes that I use at home on the trail by replacing the meat with beans. Certainly no more meat jerky. It's a joy. I make veggie jerky, dried fruit mix, trail mix from dried veggies and chickpeas, oatmeal, cookies sweetened with mashed ripe bananas or sweet potatoes. So now you've trained. Thank you, that was my pleasure. <laughs> now you've trained, you have your gear, the time has come, you're following your plan, you're on the trail. I think that's Franconia Ridge, yeah. It's so exciting to see that strip of brown in front of you. You're following blazes. See that white blaze on the rock? That is the Appalachian blaze that is, you supposedly, you can see it ahead of you or behind you on rocks or trees or buildings. The blue blazes mean side trail to water or the shelter. That's the shine of a shelter roof, which is heaven at the end of a long day of hiking. It's also the color of the Buckeye Trail, trail up somewhat. Orange blaze, you can tell from the tree, Florida Trail. And Colorado Trail has signs like that. Uh, it's such a, such a joy, it really is. All right, your hiking plan. This is so important. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. And I apply that to the food, too. I, I walk into gas stations, and I smell those donuts, and they smell so good. Do I want a momentary sweetness or continued lack of heart attacks, which I would have? Uh, anyway, don't get caught up in your initial excitement hiking. You want to get going. This is a marathon. Take breaks. Get off your feet. Air out your feet at lunchtime. Take electrolytes. Listen to your brain. Follow your plan, not your pride. Don't push beyond your limits. Think long term. You want to finish. You don't want to say, whoa, I crushed 30 miles today. No. I enjoyed walking with them for about an hour, and then they were whoosh. <laughs> Don't compare yourself to others or to your previous self. That is so important. You are what you are right now, and you are good enough. You are great. My two favorite things on the trail, being completely immersed in nature. <sighs> Colorado Trail. Just it's all wonderful. The community of hikers, other hikers. I do, I do hike mostly solo, but love hiking with my husband. That was in Maine. It was something. I love approaching the shelter in the afternoon and hearing the sound of other hikers laughing. Such a pleasure. And in town, I went to church in one town with some extra food tucked into my purse, just in case. And some church ladies invited me to Kentucky Fried. At that point, you could see I was eating chicken. I was paleo then. But I, had, I still had other healthy things with me. And it's just such a pleasure to meet people. I told them if I moved here, I now had best friends. Trail angels who are out there looking to give you some food and drink and encouragement. This was on the Florida Trail, bless his heart. They put out water if there's not much water for like 20 miles, and they, there's apps where you can find out where the water will be. 
shuttles. They give, dogs almost always are involved. You have to appreciate the moment and enjoy the journey. This nice guy picked me up and took me to where I needed to go. Stop and take time to smell the roses. Take advantage of special occasions, opportunities. That was in Vermont. This was in Maine with Bill in a kayak. This was in Maine, saw some moose from, this was on a zero day with some other passengers, made it much more affordable. It was great. And enjoy the views. And now our third and final practice is perseverance. Ambition is the path to success. Persistence is the vehicle you arrive in. It doesn't just happen. This applies to the whole process from training to hiking, to recovery at home. And there will be a recovery, even if your body is, is healthy. Listen to your body, respect the trail and the weather, and follow your plan, but also be flexible. The trail can be very easy, smooth, and pleasant. And I'm speaking literally and metaphorically, but sometimes it can be much more difficult. And sometimes the challenges are harder than you ever thought they would be. And this applies to life in general. And I love this quote, fall down seven times, stand up eight. That helped me because I had so many injuries. And this could be mental, physical, it could be time deadlines, I've got to get home for that wedding, all these challenges. My share of injuries, I mean, I've had meniscus tears, tendonitis, stress fractures, tough passes, on this one, this was on the GR5, I had a meniscus tear. I ended up renting a bike and finishing on the bike and then selling the bike. It was a used bike. Appalachian Trail, <laughs> this was a Swiss man I met. We both fist bumped and agreed we'd get to Katahdin to the end. I couldn't continue after a while because of tendonitis, just great pain. So I rented a SUV and I accompanied him and supported him and took other hikers to the trail. It was so much fun. What looks like bad news can turn into really great. When people say, what was the best, best part of the AT? Having that vehicle and helping Freeman get to uh, Katahdin and helping the other hikers. It really was. And I ended up hiking with him after all because I'd been in the car for two weeks, rested up. I thought whatever the pain was was gone. I got to the top, came home, and went home and sat on the sofa and healed. I wasn't, it wasn't, but it was wonderful. And two years later, I get choked up. <laughs> he came with me on the toughest part of the trail to get me to finish those final 220 miles. And we did it. On the Colorado Trail, it was tough passes and thunderstorms. And by the last four days, I was out of fuel in this tank, as was these other three women. And we banded together. And we all hiked our own pace. And again, we camped together. And we finished together. It was wonderful. On the Florida Trail, it's the swamps. But they're also the most wonderful. I never knew these places existed. It's wonderful. And this year, it was flooded roads. That's a road. It went on for at least half a mile, if not a mile. This is so true. Returning home is the most difficult part of long distance hiking. You have grown outside the puzzle and your peace no longer fits. People will say, how was the hike? And if they don't hike, they want to hear it like in 30 seconds. We lived overseas a lot. How was Japan? 30 seconds done. Thanks, we're moving on. So it, is, it can be hard to come back. And sometimes you can be down and a bit cranky, as I know I am when I return, because I've left mountaintop experiences and I'm back in suburbia. But you just give yourself time to recover. And you maybe make other plans. I made a point to get involved with my Facebook page that's listed there and to go to local parks. Keep up with trail friends that you've made. I made photo books of our travels. Finally, I'd like to summarize that planning, preparation, and perseverance have all served me so well. I train well. I plan my journey as best as I can. I take only the items I need, 
I fuel my body with top notch, notch fuel. I start slow in order to finish strong. And most importantly, I affirm myself and encourage myself every step of this process. In conclusion, never forget why you want to do this. That will keep you going. Your why is most important. If I can do this, I know that you can do this too. Tell yourself regularly that you can and believe in it. I want you to turn those dreams into reality. Thank you. And I would say, if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. But as much as I talk, I probably answered them all. <laughs> yes, Brandy. What is your favorite comfort item? Oh, my. Mm. Um, I'd have to say my inflatable pillow <laughs> for sleeping. Yeah, but my favorite clothing is from z Packs, which is on that list. It's just a little windbreaker that looks like nothing, but it can stop the wind. And when I put it on top of this, it's as good as a good winter coat. So yeah, that's really a good question, though. I have to say, sleep can't be shortchanged. And so I sleep on my side. I upgraded to a slightly nicer pillow, thicker, and it really does the trick. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Uh, Oh, yes, okay. The water system is the Sawyer filter. And I have just gotten this bag, which I really like. I guess it's pronounced CNOC, I don't know. It opens here. I'm pretty new to it. And when fingers are cold on a trail, okay, there we go. And it opens, there we go. And so if you're at a lake, you can scoop up water. I also have a Ziploc bag because sometimes this is just too tight and I'll fill up a Ziploc and put it in. Then you close it up and you'll fasten your Sawyer filter and it says the flow of water goes this way. So I put it on my dirty water bottle as we call it. And then I put the other end on this, which is full of water. Let's see what happens if I spill it. I won't. And then it, gravity will do its trick. And I put this on, and I'll hang it from a tree limb, and it will go through. Let's see. Well, it's empty. <laughs> but that, that's it. And then I can sit and eat while it does its trick. Or you can squeeze it through manually. Um, the tablets, Aquamira drops, things like that, they take 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. But it's tempting because it's no effort required, but I often arrive thirsty without, usually I have some water left over, but does that answer your question? Yeah, it's okay. Basically making the water along the gutter. Yes, yeah, at springs or, and on the app it shows where there will be water. Um, yeah, and I need more water. My food needs water. I use half a liter per meal, so I, I really don't want to run out. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, you do it. How, how do you, you do it? But where do you, how do you prepare yourself? Okay, look, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm exhausted. I got to keep going. Yeah. And do you eat other things to? It's uh, a good, good question. For instance, last night I slept in our backyard because I wanted to practice with my tarp, which I haven't used in a long time. And uh, I was practicing with a foam pad instead of the Nemo insulated inflatable pad. And this is from Ray Jardine's uh, instructions how to do this. But I discovered, you know, it's really not very comfortable. And it took me an hour and a half or two to go to sleep in my own backyard, thanks to trains nearby. So I woke up, you know, I probably got four hours of sleep last night, but a lot of it's mental. Um, I, I thought, oh, I'm giving the talk, I'm going to be tired, but I thought, no, just tell yourself. I did get a good four hours of sleep, I know that, so I just tell myself I'll be fine, I got good. So much of it is mental. Um, 
and just tell yourself you, that you'll be fine. And you just, when you're hiking, you just have to keep going, but you'll get on the trail and maybe take more breaks, maybe take a lunch nap, is what I would say. One advantage of the way that I do eat, I arrive at camp and I am tired. I, sometimes I can do stretching and yoga, which is nice, but in the morning I wake up like nothing ever happened. This food allows you to re recover very quickly. Um, I had the stitches in my chin a week ago. In seven days, there was no sign there was ever stitches. You, every cell of your body is affected by the food that you eat. And so I really, it has really, really helped me that way too. So I hope that answers, yeah. Other question? I saw another hand, yes sir? It, uh, it weighs one pound. This is the tarp. This is the bug net tent. And then you use pegs and you use uh, trees or you can use your hiking poles. This is my new tent, the X-Mid, but it has the net tent in it. And this is also two pounds. Uh, I'm going to be hiking. I'm very excited. In three weeks, I'm going to be out in LA for a conference, and I'm going. I looked at the map, and Santa Catalina Island is just an hour or so by boat away from there, and it's composed of. It has a 38-mile through hike from one end to almost around the island, and it's up and down mountains, but not that many. And so I'm going to be doing that, and I decided to go retro and take my, uh, take this backpack, actually I'm taking one slightly larger, a different blue that I was sewing, and I'm going to take my tarp, and I already checked on Facebook page, there's not many insects there this time of year, so I'm not going to even take the bug net tent, I'm going to go as lightweight as possible. How, that's why I was testing these things last night. This is lightweight, but uncomfortable, so I'm taking my inflatable mattress still. Uh, and I, they have, the, like the bear lockers, they have foxes there and buffalo that were left over from a Hollywood film years ago. Um, the buffalo don't come looking for the food, but the foxes do. So I don't need to take these because they have the bear boxes or the fox boxes that I can put my food in. So I'll be saving weight on that. I'm going to really enjoy that, that adventure. I've never hiked on a, well, I've, I hiked in Japan, but I've never hiked on a little island in the Pacific like that. Uh, this is my InReach Mini that I carry, a satellite, and I used a lot in the Rockies. Um, never used it on the Florida Trail. And this is pepper spray, I have to admit. I, I finally decided, especially when I heard that there's dogs, uh, rural dogs that don't want you on their property in Florida. So I just fasten it here, and it comes off really easily, and I've practiced with it. I've never had to use it. I had it on the Appalachian Trail when one year there was a crazy guy who killed some people. Um, I hate the thought, but it's realistic. Um, so that's how I protect myself, plus having two sharp pony, pointy poles. But if they came to my campsite, I'd say, I'm going to get you with my poles, but let me dismantle my whole tent right now. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I do stews uh, in here. Here is lunch, nutrient-rich potatoes. It's potatoes, parsnips, and cauliflower, and nutritional yeast, which is kind of like a Parmesan substitute. And I add lentils for more calories. And you get protein from all your food, but the highly concentrated form is in the legumes and beans. Um, and then I have balsamic vinegar in there, too, that adds some add some flavor. Uh, this is my breakfast, which I started with oatmeal, the traditional oatmeal, and then I added bananas and chickpeas. All these things are dehydrated, except the oatmeal, it's just dry oatmeal. A little garbanzo beans um, and zucchini. We make zucchini bread, why not zucchini oatmeal? Cauliflower, because it's a cruciferous vegetable, which is very good for us. And um, Sweet potatoes, my favorite, favorite, favorite. Um, and cinnamon and vanilla 
and flaxseed. And I just add water. I don't worry about any milk. I've got the oats in there, the cinnamon and vanilla. Give it the flavor. I, I've asked my daughter-in-law as a joke, if you were on execution row, what would your last meal be? She said, oh, a steak, la, la, la. How about you, Ruth? And I said, my breakfast. She said, you're kidding. Treat yourself. I said, I do every day. I love this so much. And then dinner this day is a chili. It's called Sandra's chili. And it has, um, I usually add, like there's quinoa in here and there's cooked greens, kale and Swiss chard. Those are so good for you. Um, and sweet potatoes. So, mm, mm, mm. And then <laughs> my snacks are a trail mix that I make out of jicama, J-I-C-A-M-A. Uh, sliced thin and dehydrated, very sweet and good. Red peppers, mushrooms I've marinated in balsamic for flavor. Um, and sometimes I'll add zucchini. Uh, oh, that's so good. According to the plan that I follow, I don't eat nuts because they are very high in oil, and oil is what can damage your arteries and lead to heart attacks or strokes. So my family, that's their hobby, having heart attacks, so I'm not doing that. Uh, so chickpeas give me the crunch I want. Uh, this is just dried fruit. I buy what I can, no sugar added, just the taste of the fruit. So a lot of it I dehydrate. These are cookies, and they're oatmeal cookies. I'd share with you, but this is all I have <laughs> right here. Uh, these are dark. I started with oats and mashed bananas and cinnamon and vanilla, and that was it. And then I thought, you know, you put zucchini in bread, so I grated zucchini. Well, we've got carrot cake. I put carrots in it. These are red or brownish because I added minced beets, cooked beets from Costco, and so sweet and good. It looks really, sounds strange, but it's like a complete meal. Uh, I could live off of these. And sometimes I'll even finely, finely chop chickpeas just to get more calories in there. I tend to lose about five, five pounds on the trail. That's not too bad at all. You, you put out almost 500 calories per hour hiking with a full backpack if you're really working it. So that's one day's food. So I'll say to Bill, send me four days worth of food to Breckenridge in Colorado. And so he'll just go to the deep freeze, four days, boom, boom, box sends it to me. Uh, and if I want other things, he's at my beck and call. <laughs> so, yeah. And like the cookies, I don't rehydrate. I just, I, I dehydrate them. I don't even bake them. I just let, the dehydrator operates at 125 to 135 degrees. And on the Excalibur, the black one, it's in the back and it blows the air forward through the trays. On the Nesco Garden Master, it's in the lid and it blows it down through that center hole. But um, I, don't even, I don't need to cook them. They cook at 125 degrees for 10 hours in there. And midway, it sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of prep. I always have an inventory in my mind of what's in the deep freeze. Um, but I'll go in midway after five hours and just switch trays a bit, turn in the food mesh, move it around so it all gets dried evenly. Um, I, it is a lot of work, but otherwise, what am I going to do? Stay home? This is my passion. It's my passion. And they say those who are interested in something will do whatever is convenient, and those who are committed do whatever it takes to get it done. This is what it takes, and it's my hobby. I enjoy the satisfying feeling of providing my own food. Uh, so, and hikers have been very curious. They don't make any silly jokes about it, about eating nuts and twigs and bark, <laughs> you know, that some might do. They're very respectful of it. So, any other, yes, sir. Yes. What would I say a four-day backpack weight? Oh. Good question, yeah. You try to get the weight of it definitely under 20 pounds with the non-consumables. That means your gear, not the food, not the water, uh, basically. Um, I hover around 17 pounds probably because I take some comforts with me. But you're looking basically at what I take, but it all packs down. But then the food, this is about a pound and a half. So it is heavy when you leave. You know, if I've got four days' worth of food in there, you know, that's six extra pounds. Yeah. Um, or sometimes five days. You can't wish the towns were closer, and there's only so far I can go. 
And so, yeah, and I just have to really, I just, <laughs> I'll show you how this opens. Let's see, oh, uh, my bear canister, I'm just cramming it in there. And so I just, I will just cram the food in there. I, I've learned ways to fit it in. But if there's a little extra, like for the first day, I put it, I carry one of these. They're called op sacks. And they say they're odor proof. They're like a thick Ziploc. But it's just for the, the very first day I eat it. And then everything else will fit in there. And this is what goes in the ur sack too, to when you tie this, you just tie it, they say, to a base of a tree. And it, bears live in trees, but they're going to get it wherever, uh, wherever you hang it. But I've had no incident with the bears. Just so you know, this is, this is the quilt, Ray Jardine's quilt. You know, I, it's, it could compact more. Once you put it in the backpack, it does. This is a compression bag, and this has a down quilt in it. I'm going to be taking this with me. I decided this is just too bulky, so I'm going to use my tarp, I'm going to use my backpack, and I'm going to use this down, jack, down sleeping bag in here. So, any other questions? I think we've covered much of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>